Hello and welcome to another 30 Minute Thursday. My name is Amit. It is 2 p.m. Thursday afternoon in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, and we are live on Facebook. My apologies in advance, guys. My setup is a little bit wonky today. What's new, right? Um, I have a uh, neighbor who is mowing their lawn very, very loudly over there. It's nice. It'll keep the property values up, if nothing else. But I am broadcasting from home today, as you probably uh, gathered the giraffe behind me and the COVID balls up above. They're not really COVID balls. They're leftover decoration from a party long, long ago. We just kind of grew to like them. And so we kept them. But um, there's a lot going on. And I've got a, a thing to go to later on this afternoon. So I just figured I'd do my work from home. And of course, my neighbor across the way, right over that way, decided that this would be a good time to mow their lawn. So uh, if you hear that background noise, my apologies in advance. What can I tell you? Live video. It is what it is. Let me um, welcome you all, though, and um, tell you that it's great to see you. I hope everyone's staying safe. I hope everybody's staying healthy. Hope everybody's staying sane. And um, um, I hope you guys are doing great in general. So let's just jump right in and talk about what's going on with the economy, what's going on with mortgage interest rates, what's going on with inflation. Um, this has been an action-packed week uh, for data and information about the markets, information about what's going on with inflation in general. The uh, consumer price index came out on Wednesday, that was yesterday. Uh, we also had comments from the Fed, um, from members, various members of the Fed. Uh, that's coming out tomorrow. We've got um, all sorts of minutes being released from last month's Fed meeting. Today, the producer price index measure of inflation, wholesale inflation came out. Just a bunch of information and a lot of stuff to kind of wrap our brains around and figure out what to do and, and how to do it and what, what it's going to do for our economy and for mortgage interest rates. So without further ado, let me just jump right in and describe two very big measures of inflation for you and discuss with you how one differs from the other because these reports were just released one yesterday, one today. I've got charts, I've got information, and hopefully I'll help bring you up to speed on what all of this stuff really means and, and how it how it works. Hold on one second. I'm a little bit behind schedule. Hey Siri, turn on the do not disturb. There we go. So as you can tell, it's live broadcast and stuff happens. So um, without further ado, let me just tell you. Okay, so my apologies. Uh, we've got a couple of different measures of inflation coming out this week. One of them is the consumer price index. This is a big deal. This talks about what you and I basically pay for uh, on a variety of different goods and services and how the cost of those goods and services when aggregated with a weighted average, um, how they impact the inflation, both for any given month, like a 30 day period and year over year. So yesterday we received the consumer price index information for the month of March of 2023. So the month previous to this one, and we also looked at how consumer price index is changing from last year, March, to this year, March. That's the year over year calculation. Okay, so keep that in mind. And let me just tell you that today we received the producer's price index. This is also for the month of March. So it's a month behind, basically. And there's also a year over year calculation, meaning how did we look last March 2022? How are we looking March 2023? All that happens, generally speaking, uh, the same way. The difference between the CPI, Consumer Price Index, and the PPI, Producers Price Index, is pretty significant, though. The Producers Price Index is what they call the wholesale number. This is the cost of goods and services that go into making other goods and services. So it's the raw materials, basically, that producers pay for in order to make the stuff that you and I buy, like this beautiful iPhone that I had to silence. Um, now, sometimes when prices go up for producers, they pass that cost on to the consumer, and sometimes they don't. It just depends. And there's no real formula that I can share with you. There's no magic 
number or magic sort of equation that I can take take you through on what gets passed on and what does not get passed on. But I will say, in general, the producer price index and the consumer price index run in parallel. And let me let me try this here. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, here we go. High tech time. I'm going to get my screen share and I'm going to pull this guy up and I'm going to ask the computer to share it with us. Oh, man, I am so happy about this. Okay, so the red line on this graph is the producer price index, and the blue line is the consumer price index. And hopefully y'all can see that, but if you can't, let me do this even. Wow, look at this. Whoop. Okay, so I'm enlarging my screen just a little bit here, but you can see that these two charts or these two uh, um lines tend to run in pretty close parallel. The producer price index is in red and the consumer price index is in blue. And for the consumer price index, that's what represents what you and I are paying uh, or, or the cost of goods that you and I consume um, from one day to another, from one month to another. And this is what was released April 12th of 2023 for the consumer price index of March of 2023. And here we go. So the headline number was good. It was 1% increase versus a 2% increase, which or estimated 2% increase. So that's good. That, that actually shows that the things are moderating. That's on the headline number. And the core number showed a 0.4% increase as expected. Now, what is the difference between headline and core? We get really deep into the weeds here, but basically the headline number is the total cost, the total consumer price index. The core number strips out very important things, food and energy prices. And why do they strip out food and energy prices? Because basically, whatever the Federal Reserve Board can or cannot do, they cannot impact the cost of food and oil or food and energy. However much they try, whatever much they say they can or can't do, those things are baked into the cake. And we're going to pay that price regardless because you need food and you need gas. Now, you may not need some of these other things that go into the total number of um, or, or into the other things that are made up by uh, consumer price index, but you need food and you need heat, you need gas, so you're going to pay that anyway. Now, I want to take you to this really impressive number here. Year over year, the headline number, so the total number, went from 6% inflation to 5% inflation. So it came down by one solid percent from last year to this year. That's huge. That is a really big number. But if you look at the core it went from 5.5 to 5.6% year over year, meaning that it actually went up by 0.1%, which is not great, okay? So what this means is we're not done yet. We have a long, long way to go. And what's really beaten us up here is shelter and lodging. So if you look at shelter, that's the cost of rent, the cost of your mortgage as it equates to rent and things of that nature. This makes up 43% of the total number of CPI, and it's still way too high. It went up by 0.6% month over month. And so we are still battling that. When this gets corrected, and it will, and it'll start coming down hopefully next month, but certainly in the months to follow, the core and the uh, full rate of inflation will come down as well. So things are moving in the right direction, and that's really awesome, uh, but we still have a ways to go. And as a result of that, we're still seeing a bunch of volatility in the markets that make up the mortgage interest rates. What does volatility look like? Hold on one second, let me show it to you here. Here we go. Uh, let me get another screen share here. I absolutely love it. And let me see if I can uh, share this screen. Whoops. Hold on one second, guys. Bear with me. Um, okay. I hope this is going to work. Uh, and I need to find something here to share. Well, 
Yep. There we go. Share that. Okay. Hopefully you could see this. This is in real time. This is a service I subscribe to that tracks interest rates for the U.S. 10-year Treasury note, which is a really big instrument that kind of goes hand in hand with the uh, with the mortgage interest rates. And this is the universal mortgage-backed securities interest rate, which is the instrument that we sell or that we create when we do mortgages for you guys. And if you look at this, this is a chart up and down, up and down, up and down in real time of just how volatile this market is. Um, it continues to be volatile. It continues to be impacted by the rate of inflation. But what I really want to pull your attention to is the 10-year treasury note. This is what the U.S. government sells, among other things, to finance the debt that we carry. And the interest rate on that is, I'm going to round this up, 3.45%. Why is that important? Because historically speaking, let me stop this share here. Here we go. I'm, I'm getting really handy with that. Historically speaking, the difference between the 30-year fixed rate mortgage interest rate and the 10-year treasury note interest rate is somewhere between 1.75% and 2%. That's historically speaking over 35 years. Let me do another screen share and I will show you exactly what I'm talking about. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Look at this. Beautiful. Um, historically speaking, this is the 10-year treasury in the blue line here, the bottom line, and the 30-year fixed rate mortgage interest rate in the yellow line or the top line. And you'll notice that they kind of mirror one another. When this one goes up, this one goes up. When this one comes down, this one comes down. They mirror one another. And historically speaking, the difference between the yellow graph or the yellow line, which is the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, and the blue line, which is the 10-year treasury, the difference is usually 1.75% to 2% difference. Meaning that if the 10-year treasury note is trading at 3.45% today, which it is, I just showed it to you on that other screen, then the 30-year fixed rate mortgage should be somewhere around 5.5% or less, which it's not. It's more along the lines of 6.5%. So it is trading roughly 3% above the 10-year treasury. And that is what we're working to condense. And that is what will condense when we catch up with inflation, when we bring inflation all the way down. We will see this spread or this difference between the top line and the bottom line come closer to the average distance, which is 1.75 or 2%. So 30-year fixed rate mortgage interest rates are going to come down. How do I know this? Because this is a 35-year history of this chart going all the way back to 1991 and beyond. So I know that this is going to mirror one another eventually, but the market's got to get over being spooked, and they will. So I want to give you some additional numbers here about PPI, producer price index. This is, I, I've joked in the past and said that this is kind of like the Rodney Dangerfield of economic inflation data because it gets no respect. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember that comedian, but uh, that's what he would do. And he'd pull on his collar. I get no respect, no respect. Well, the PPI can definitely say that because most people do not really follow it significantly, but it, it is very, very telling. And looking at my handwritten notes, handwritten notes, I will tell you that last month, the headline number for PPI was 4.9%. Today, it is sitting at 2.7%. So it is coming way down. And last year at this time, so the year over year, it's come down from 11.7% to 2.7%. So 9% reduction in the cost of raw materials and goods. That I would say that's supply chain stuff, right? We heard a lot last year about supply chain problems. We can't do things the way we used to do because COVID destroyed our supply chains and so on and so forth. Well, the supply chain is healing and the cost of raw materials and goods that go into the supply chain has come down by 9% from last year at this time to today. So that is kind of leading the way. Now, as the cost of raw materials 
comes down, the cost of what goes into the things that we buy comes down, guess what? The cost of the things we buy eventually will also come down. Guess what? That means that the rate of inflation will come down. Guess what? That means that this will also come down and the difference between the 10-year treasury interest rate and the 30-year fixed rate mortgage interest rate will also get closer, closer to more natural and typical sort of uh, spread, which means that interest rates are also going to come down. All of this is happening in real time, slowly but surely. It is happening. Here's the bad news. Our Federal Reserve Board is not finished yet. They are still doing what we refer to as driving in the rear view mirror, meaning that they've got their hands on the wheel, but they're looking up at the rear view mirror to try to navigate which way they're going, but they're going this way and they're looking that way. They're looking backwards. And so there is still a 70% chance that when the Federal Reserve Board meets next month, May 2nd, I believe is their meeting, when they meet next time, they're going to raise interest rates once again, by another 25 basis points or a quarter of 1%. So they're going to keep pushing those interest rates, their short-term interest rates up because they really want to put the nail in the coffin, so to speak, of the inflationary pressure. And what that has the potential of doing is, is causing more harm to the economy, unfortunately, because these interest rates that, that the banks are, are using, that they are borrowing money from the Fed as a lender of last resorts, it has an impact on the economy. Nothing happens in a vacuum. I think I, I've illustrated that for you guys pretty well over the months and years with these charts and with these graphs and everything else. Nothing happens in a vacuum. And we're already seeing interest rates that the banks are, are dealing with. We're already seeing credit that the banks are extending come down, meaning that they're not as cavalier, they're not as bold to make loans to people as they were a year ago. And so they're already tightening their supply of money. Money is coming out of the economy. That's what the Fed's whole purpose of raising interest rates is, to take money out of the economy. Well, the banks that are um, concerned about their liquidity and their solvency and everything else. I imagine that you've read about some of these regional banks or some of these larger banks like Silicon Valley Bank and whatnot. There has been some bank failures, Credit Suisse among them, right? And so banks that are not failing are saying we don't want to fail. And so we are not going to be as bold in the way we loan money out in the coming months. So they're already tightening the mon the monetary supply or the amount of dollars that are just floating around in the economy. They're doing the Fed's job for them out of the need to preserve themselves as, uh, as solvent banks. And so they're already taking the lead. The Fed is just pushing a little bit harder. And so we will see, uh, more likely than not, one more interest rate hike in May. And once we get there, hopefully, all of these additional numbers will start to catch up. All of these efforts that we've made, that the Fed has made, all of these uh, components of the um, of the core inflation, the headline inflation, the producer's price index, the consumer price index, all of that stuff is going to catch up. Let me give you an, an idea. Year over year, uh, the core... Uh, Sorry, I took the wrong notes down. I won't give you an idea. I'll tease you with it and I'll tell you, I'll tell you about it next week. But things are coming down. We are seeing things come down. We are seeing things get to a point where uh, this inflation is going to moderate. The question now is, will the Fed stop looking in the rearview mirror and start paying attention to where they're driving this economy? Or will they continue to try to salvage whatever their reputation is left and really put the pedal to the metal on these interest rate hikes and try to make up for lost time and run the risk of causing some real chaos in the economy. I don't know, but historically speaking, uh, they've not been very good at doing their job. So um, I imagine that they're going to continue to hike rates until something really uh, comes off the, ra the rails or something breaks. That's that's kind of like the joke with, with people who watch the Fed. They're going to continue to do stuff badly until something breaks, and then they'll know that they've achieved their goal. 
And that's really ugly. I'm, I'm not going to kid you. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. It's not a very pleasant sort of visual, but it is kind of what the Fed tends to do. They're like a, a bull in a china shop. They just keep moving and keep smashing stuff. There's not a lot of um, uh, finesse in what they do. But hopefully over time, things will catch up, things will stabilize, and mortgage interest rates will come down. So let me pivot and talk to you about what happens when mortgage interest rates come down, because I am of the opinion, and I see it right now, that we're going to have a huge problem in the immediate term when it comes to buying your new home, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Now, some of these other locations, some of these other markets may be a little bit different, but the Pacific Northwest, especially for you real estate partners, excuse me, we don't have inventory. We have never had an abundance of inventory. All the inventory numbers that we look at for single family homes, they all have a, a heavy influence because they're national numbers. So even back in the day, like 2006, 2007, when we had a huge inventory surplus of 4 million homes in inventory, that wasn't the Pacific Northwest. That was nationwide, and, and those were places like Texas, Florida, Nevada, Arizona, places where, you know, it's easy to build, it's easy to find lots of lots of available land, and it's easy to get permits to, to build. That is not the case in the Pacific Northwest. They say, you know, all real estate is local, and I do agree with that to a great degree. So looking at the Pacific Northwest for my referral partners and my real estate partners who are, and my, my clients who are here locally in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, uh, we don't have the inventory. We'll never have the inventory. It just won't happen. As it stands, 15% of all homes in the United States that are sold come from new construction. That's the national average, 15%. That means that 85% are existing homes, meaning something that somebody already owns and is reselling. In the Pacific Northwest, I would hazard unscientific guess, but I would say that we're looking somewhere in the single digits for what sort of uh, new home sales make up our total homes sold in this market. I would I would be shocked if it was more than 8% or even 6% because there's just not a lot of builders up here. They they don't have economies of scale. I've I've worked with builders up here, production builders, big builders that that build tens of thousands of homes nationwide. They cannot get the amount of land necessary to have a large project here in the Pacific Northwest. So I would say that their contribution to the total homes being sold is probably 8%. Let's just use that as a number, which means that 92% of the homes that we're going to be looking to buy in the Pacific Northwest for our clients come from someone like me who's selling the house like this one behind me. Guess what? It ain't going to happen. A lot of people are not going to sell for a lot of reasons. Number one, I love where I live. Number two, I've got a great interest rate that's really, really low. I'm not going to replace that interest rate with a higher interest rate. So if I was going to want to move to a different home, wherever that home might be, maybe it's in Florida, maybe it's in Buenos Aires, maybe it's in Texas, maybe it's somewhere else, wherever it is, I'm probably not selling this house though, right? I'm probably just going to turn it into a rental, which is fine for me but it doesn't help that next home buyer. And so we have this perpetual cycle of absence or lack of inventory here in the Pacific Northwest. And when we hit interest rates, hit turbulence a year ago or eight months ago, and everyone freaked out because the 30-year fixed rate went into the 7% range, and everyone was like, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. A lot of buyers exited the market. And when they exited the market, they reduced the level of competition, albeit for a short period of time. It was temporary. And that, that feeling is that they're going to come back sooner rather than later, right? I showed you that, that chart of the 10-year treasury note interest rate and the 30-year fixed rate mortgage interest rate, and it should be like 2% difference. So it should be somewhere around five and a half or less based on today's math. Well, when it becomes five and a half or less, all of these buyers are coming back. Everyone that was hoping to get a home a year ago or a year and a half ago or whatever it is that didn't get a home, they're coming back. And we've got about that much inventory 
and we got about that many people wanting to get into this much inventory, what do y'all think is going to happen? I mean, this is basic supply and demand stuff now. You don't have to be an economic genius, and I'm certainly not one, but I know that when, hey, look, let's talk about something really simple as a, as a kind of as a, uh, an example, Taylor Swift tickets, right? Uh, a few months ago, the world went absolutely crazy because everyone wanted to go to this concert and there were only like this many tickets and I can't even get my hands on the screen, but there were a bunch of people that wanted to go to the show. So what happened to the price of those tickets? They shot up, right? So much so that people started calling for like congressional investigations into Ticketmaster and price gouging and scalping and whatever other stuff. I'm old enough to remember that when we wanted to go to a concert, we'd camp out by the venue the night before and wait in line so that we can buy tickets that next morning when they came available. That's how analog I am. That's how we did it. But now everything's done online and so on and so forth. And that's fine. I get it. But it's a simple matter of supply and demand, guys. When you have a whole lot of people trying to get into a small venue or trying to get a limited resource, whether it's concert tickets or housing or something else, you're going to have a price spike. And so everyone who's thinking, oh, prices are going to come down on real estate, so on and so forth. I don't think so. It may not go up as fast as it did two years ago when we saw, you know, 20% year over year appreciation, but I'm willing to wager you that the millions of people that are trying to get into real estate, both here and in other states who are just waiting for interest rates to come down a little bit, they're seeing the same thing I'm seeing. And if their mortgage lender is worth anything, and if they're as good as I am, which I doubt, but if they're, if they're good, then they're telling their clients the same thing I'm telling you guys, like things are changing. Give it a few more months. Give it another half year. Wait and see what happens with interest rates. Well, when that time comes, guess what? Everyone's going to jump back into the into the into the party, and we simply do not have the inventory. And so, if you want to get into real estate, and you should, you should want to do that. You should be thinking about buying right now. You should have been thinking about buying a few months ago, but that time's passed. The best time to do it is right now. And I know that that's counterintuitive, but I assure you, I would much rather get into a house right now and refinance my mortgage in six months or a year or whenever it is, then wait six months or a year and not be able to get into a house because there's oodles more buyers coming to the market and there just simply are not the homes available to sell or to buy. I know it sounds like a broken record. Uh, my apologies in advance, but the news is the same over and over and over again. We've got a small window in time that is closing where you can get into a home with less competition than you would have had 18 months ago. But that time is passing. And when that time passes, remember, as this inflation comes down, when it does come down and interest rates follow suit, everybody else is going to come back into the market and say, hey, I'm ready to buy now. Let's make a deal. And it's going to be a lot harder to make a deal. And it's going to be a lot harder to find a home that you want to buy. So with that in mind, we're <laughs> right up to that two minute, uh, that 30 minute window. It's amazing how time flies. Uh, seems that my neighbor finished mowing their lawn. Hopefully they'll come mow my, my lawn next, but I'm not counting on it. They're good neighbors though. Anyway, all that nonsense notwithstanding. I want to thank you guys for taking a little bit of time with me this Thursday afternoon. Thanks for watching my slides, my my uh, my information about inflation, about consumer price index, producers price index. We covered a lot of ground and that might leave you guys feeling a little bit confused. If you are, if you want follow-up, if you want specific information, if you want to dig deeper on this, please call me, talk to me, email me, reach me through Facebook. If you're seeing me here now, you know how to find me. So please don't be shy. Let's talk about it because the opportunity is now and that opportunity is slipping away. So I'd love to help you guys out. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, and have a wonderful weekend. I will see you next week, 30-Minute Thursday. Until then, take care and have a fantastic weekend. Bye-bye.